Good evening. Welcome to the Washington County Senate Candidate Forum. This program is part of the series presented by Orca Media and The Bridge to give voters a general, a good idea of what their, uh, what their candidates stand for. I'm Tom McCone, moderator for this evening's program. With redistricting, in addition to all Washington County communities, this Senate district now includes Braintree, Orange, and Stowe. Welcome to voters from all communities. These forums are intended to provide candidates with the opportunity to share their views and to explain why they think they should be elected. They, it is not a debate, so they will not be asking each other questions. Before introducing the candidates, I'll go over the format. We ask the public for questions in advance, and we use that feedback to help us develop a list of questions from which we will draw this evening. The candidates were not given any questions in advance. During this program, we will also take call-in questions. A volunteer will write down those questions and pass them on to me. If you have a question you want to suggest, call us at 802-224-9901. That number will periodically be displayed on the bottom of the screen. We'll ask as many questions as we can fit into 90 minutes. Each candidate will have up to two minutes to introduce themselves, to explain why they are running, and to make opening remarks. After that, candidates will have a minute and a half to answer each question, and at the end, they will get one minute for a closing statement. The moderator has the discretion to make adjustments should any be needed. We have a timer in the studio that will help the candidates to keep track of how much time they have left. For their opening statements, I will call on the candidates in the same order they are listed on the ballot. After that, I will vary the order so that each candidate has the opportunity to go first and last, and so that they do not always go before or after the same people. <coughs> this district has three senators, so you will be able to vote for up to three candidates. Now, let's meet the candidates. Paul Matthew Bean is a Republican from Northfield. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Ann Cummings is a Democrat from Montpelier. Welcome, Ann. Thank you. Dexter Lefebvre of Middlesex is running as a Republican and Libertarian. Welcome, Dexter. Andrew Perchlick of Marshfield is running as a Democrat and Progressive. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. And Ann Watson of Montpelier is also running as a Democrat and Progressive. Welcome, Ann. It's good to be here. The sixth candidate on the ballot, uh, Dwayne Tucker, a Republican from Barrytown, was invited but is not with us this evening. So now we're going to move on to the candidates' opening statements. Uh, so we will be doing these in the, in the order in which I just introduced the candidates. It will be uh, Paul, Ann Cummings, Dexter, Andrew, and then Ann Watson. So, Paul, would you start for us? Sure. So my name is Paul Bean. I'm from Northfield, Vermont. I grew up on a dairy farm that was converted into a Chevy dealership long, after, or long before I was born. Um, I went to the University of Vermont. I studied public communications. Uh, Throughout my schooling there, I sold things online, everything from books to inflatable pools to records, uh, Amazon, eBay, that kind of thing. It was pretty cool. Um, recently, I've worked for Cardinal Point Screen Printing and Embroidery in Northfield. Uh, I worked for Fortune Marketing in Barrie. I've done some painting. I've done some landscaping this summer. I've done all sorts of work. Um, but now I'm stepping in as a young, aspiring political leader politician, whatever you want to call me. Uh, I'm, I'm a Republican candidate, and I'm running because I think Vermont needs a young voice. Uh, I think it's really important that there's a young voice and that young people are represented. I think I know as well as anyone why young people are leaving the state of Vermont in such high numbers. Um, my campaign is about self-sufficient state economy, workforce development, environmental stewardship, 
and individual responsibility. And I see that the timer is not going. That's right. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and, and finish my statement because I think that was about two minutes. Okay. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Paul. Ann Cummings. Thank you. And thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I'm Ann Cummings. I am the veteran, I guess, by far. Um, I've been in the Senate for over 20 years. I keep doing this because I believe in democracy. I really like working with people, bringing them together, and solving our mutual problems. I think that's very important. I think this year I would like to go back because I think that's more important than ever. This country has been through an immense amount of social change. Um, democracy is under a threat that it has never been under before. We're even starting to see some of that uncivility filter down into Vermont. I think it's very important that we have a voice in the legislature uh, that is committed to bringing all different people together to treat them with respect and to work out mutual uh, solutions to very serious problems that we're going to be dealing with. We're going to be dealing with climate and the housing crisis and the economy and the national economy and the world and you know, inflation. It's going to be vitally important that we hold together and that we not devolve into fighting. I think it's also important we are seeing a third turnover. A third of the legislators in both the House and the Senate are not coming back. We're losing a lot of um, institutional memory. I've been told this is the biggest turnover since World War II. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important that we get new young voices, but I think mm -hmm. we, it's also important that we have some voices of experience there, and I would like to be one of those voices. Thank you, Ian. Dexter. Thank you, Tom. Uh, my name is Dexter Lefevre. I live in, in Middlesex. Um, I've been in Vermont uh, since 1981. Uh, I grew up uh, outside of Boston, and uh, my family uh, would vacation in the mountains. We were tent campers, and we traveled to, uh, throughout northern New England, and um, I became a skier. Uh, along the way and just uh, really craved uh, a chance to explore life in the mountains. And that happened to me in 1981. I was three years out of college. Uh, I found, uh, found a job in the Burlington area. Uh, so I moved here at the age of 24 and, uh, you know, went right to work um, over the years. Um, I left for a couple of years uh, due to there was a recession and I, had a, there, I was uh, faced with either a uh, um, being laid off or relocating to New York. So I did that for a couple of years. But uh, the time I was gone, I just totally wanted to get back. Uh, I did uh, make a good start financially in New York and then came back uh, a couple of years later and settled in Middlesex. And I've been there ever since. I've raised uh, four kids there. Two have been through uh, mm -hmm. U32 with you. Mm -hmm. And two others have been through U32 after you. Um, so. Uh, uh, great success with them. Um, three out of the four of them are still in Vermont, and the fourth is uh, living in um, uh, Dominican Republic uh, as a yoga instructor and surfer, so not a bad lifestyle. Um, I'm running to bring uh, balance to the legislature. I think that the, uh, the imbalance that exists right now is something that uh, could benefit from a shift. Uh, so I would represent that shift. I'm grateful to have the nominations of both the Republican and Libertarian parties, although I consider myself an independent and not a member of either um, party. Uh, so that's kind of a curious uh, distinction, but it's one that, that I feel strongly about. And I'm, I feel well aligned with both parties as far as being a fiscal conservative and a socially liberal uh, gives me room in both of those groups. Uh, I've got a lot of friends in all parties. Uh, D, P, L, R. Uh, I've got friends all across the spectrum. And uh, that's part of what I want to do in the legislature is, is work with these friends and uh, do the hard work to make the changes that will make Vermont better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dexter. Andrew. 
Yeah, thank you. I am a candidate for state senate this year. I've been a senator for the last four years, and I want to be a candidate again to hope to get reelected as state senator to serve the people of the district. I st believe strongly in public service. I was a Peace Corps volunteer after college. My first job in Vermont was as a VISTA volunteer. And then when we moved to Marshfield, where we raised our three children, I was active in that community, was on the select board, was on the volunteer fire department for many years, active in several you know, community organizations and, and nonprofits in the area. And as I said, for the last four years as state senator, and I want to continue that, that service for the, for the people of the district. Specifically, I want to work on policies that support and advance the, the well-being of children and families in the district. So that's paid family leave for families, that's uh, affordable and accessible child care. And particularly, I'm interested in adolescence and after-school programs, something that I agree with, with, with Governor Scott, that it's important that we have universal after-school programs, and that's before school, after school, when school's on vacation. So those kids have, have somewhere to go and have mentorship uh, when they're outside of school. I really believe in policies to build a strong, clean energy economy in the state. I think we have huge potentials for building our economy based on clean energy and stop exporting our dollars for fossil fuels. When we buy uh, fossil fuel, 80 cents of every dollar, 70 cents of every dollar goes out of state. But if we buy renewable energy, it's reversed, like 70 cents stays in the state. And also, I believe in democracy, as Senator Cummings said, I'm concerned more on a national scale. But I think there's things that we could do here in, in Vermont as well. We can build our civics education and civic <coughs> involvement. And I, I think for the next presidential primary, we should have ranked choice voting. That'll help all the, all the different parties that we have in the state. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Ann Watson. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Ann Watson, I am currently serving as the mayor of Montpelier. I am also a teacher and a, a coach. I'm a union member. Uh, and uh, I've dedicated the majority of my adult life to public service. So I've, uh, as a teacher, I have uh, been teaching physics and engineering and math for the past 18 years uh, at Montpelier High School. Uh, and as a teacher there, I have uh, seen kids come through and be very concerned about climate change. And so that is actually why I am running. I also am very concerned about uh, the climate. I think this is uh, an issue that uh, needs government intervention. We need to make sure that uh, the government is making it affordable and uh, accessible and easy for folks to make the kind of changes that need to happen. Uh, and in addition, I get to uh, meet folks from all walks of life. And so I get to see that uh, a lot of uh, Vermont's economic policies are really not working for a lot of Vermont families. And as uh, has been mentioned, uh, things like uh, paid family leave would be really helpful. Uh, we need more housing at all levels. Uh, but particularly affordable housing. Uh, we have a, a workforce crisis right now. I'm really uh, interested in working on that. And I, I can also, I, I would like to, to see us uh, work on childcare, especially uh, high quality and affordable child childcare. As a new mom, uh, I am experiencing that right now. Uh, so I, I believe our experiences matter, <clears throat> excuse me. And what, uh, what we bring to the table is, uh, certainly our experience. And, and uh, so as a new mom, it has been uh, certainly challenging to find childcare. So I'm excited to have uh, the conversation tonight. Okay, thank you, Ann. So for the first question, the order will be Dexter, Ann Watson, Andrew, Ann Cummings, and then Paul. And that question is, what is the most important is issue for your district? If you are elected, when you're in the State House, how are you going to use that role to improve things in your district? So uh, as I go around and, sp and speak to uh, voters and residents in the district, I find that uh, the uh, issue of affordability rings true for everyone. Everyone knows what that means. Everyone knows that uh, people are having a hard time uh, making ends meet. Uh, Vermont is one of the uh, more expensive states to live in in the United States, and it's also a state with some of the lowest income. And there, that creates a disparity uh, that's really difficult. So uh, my objective would be to close that gap 
to uh, change things to the extent the government can to make it uh, more affordable uh, for people. We need to reduce the tax burden on people. Uh, we need to uh, help bring in industry that will create more better paying jobs. Um, and uh, really just look deeply at some of the policies that we have that really hurt people. Um, you know, climate change is a real concern to a lot of people. Uh, Vermont's done a lot over the decades uh, in bringing renewables uh, into the communities, but it's done so in a way that has hurt people financially. Efficiency Vermont, I think, is a good example of a program that puts a 6% tax on everyone's electric bill uh, and benefits uh, more wealthy people. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that need to change. I will promote sensible policy with respect to energy and climate change. Okay. Thank you, Dexter. Ian? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so one of the issues that I have been hearing over and over about from folks in the district is the need for housing. And we know a lot of folks uh, in uh, the Washington district are uh, renters and are finding their rents are increasing and uh, or they're being pushed out. You know, I, I have friends where actually uh, their landlords are selling the building and they're being forced to move. Uh, and they're finding that there's very little, if anything, uh, available. So uh, one of the things that I would love to see us work on is um, increasing the, the amount of housing uh, availability uh, in the Washington district. Uh, and that, I think, uh, there's a, a number of ways that I think we can do that. So uh, one is uh, with Act 250 reform. Some reforms were made uh, previously, but I think there's more that we can do, particularly to make it easier to build in downtowns. I think if we're not intentional, um, about how we build, uh, we'll just end up with sprawl. I'm actually also from Vermont, uh, and I so I've, I've grown up with uh, Act 250 and seen uh, the good that it has done. Uh, but I, I think at this point, it needs to be reformed, particularly to make it easier to build in our downtowns. I'd also like to uh, see us uh, spend more uh, on supporting uh, folks that are experiencing homelessness, and that is uh, also increasingly an issue. Um, so yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Andrew. Yeah. The reason I brought up children and family in my open statement is that I, I hear a lot about concerns about our children and in, to an extension family. I think in particular, it, it, when I talk to, to families, a lot of them that just new families that have one child are saying it's partially an affordability thing that we're only going to have one child. And we have a, an issue with a declining population in the state or barely, you know, a flat population. And we need, I think, to support families, to encourage those families that want to have more than one child, to have more than one child, to, to have a growing population and a, and a vibrant youth population in the state. And I think there's a lot of things that we can do to support families to, to have the children that they want to have and to support those families when they, when they, when they exist. And that's the child care. That's the after school programs. But also, I hear a lot of concern just about the state of our adolescents and our, our high school students and the amount of anxiety and mental health kind of issues. We have problems in the state with acute mental health issues with our youth. We have no beds. Uh, a lot of, I talk to parents that have, have a child that goes through a mental health crisis and they get locked in the emergency room for days, weeks at a time. So there's things that we can do for very acute situations with mental health with adolescents, but also just the day-to-day the -day work that we do in our schools and really support our public school system and have strong community schools to build stronger Vermonters for the future. Thank you, Andrew. Ann Cummings. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's any one issue that, uh, you know, was focused on on the Washington district. I think we're all going to have an issue in how do we integrate the three towns that we picked up. How do we reach out to them and hear their specific issues? And I think um, last year we did some town hall meetings over Zoom, and that worked well. And I think we've all committed that we're going to do those as we go through the session so that we can hear from places like Braintree are fairly remote. Um, and it's a good drive to get down there and, and not a lot of big events to, to get to know people. I think in this area, a lot of the issues we've talked about are really quality of life. Um, you know, I, the pandemic taught us that child care and paid leave um, 
you know, good health care, um, affordability are all uh, vitally important. I think uh, I chair finance. I have for a long time. We deal with taxes, and a lot of we all know what we need. Where we hit a wall is how we pay for it. Um, all the programs we like, the countries that have them, my son lives in Canada, um, pay a much higher percent of their income in taxes. And that's, that's going to be a challenge for us. Okay. Thank you, Ann. And Paul? Sure. I think what, when I hear from people and when I'm talking with people, and what, what I've gathered is I think the biggest issue overall is definitely affordability. Um, I like to think of it in two different uh, demographics of people that I really am looking to represent is you have, of course, the young people who are in the state. They're, they're leaving in droves. Um, there's not a lot of housing. There's not a lot of economic, economic opportunity that is considered high quality. Uh, and then there's the second demographic of people, and that is the older generation. I'm thinking of, you know, my grandparents, for example. And they're kind of looking at their lives and where they're at, and they're saying, you know, I'm on a fixed income. I'm not really looking to go take a part-time job driving a bus or, uh, you know, watching chairs at Sugarbush or something like that to make ends meet. Uh, so I think we have to think about, in, in the legislature, what can we do to ensure that things are affordable uh, and that we're not continually piling on costs. Uh, and also, we need to, it, it comes back to, to workforce development for me. I think we have to be educating our, our youth on the opportunities that do exist um, within our state without going to college. Um, you can work in all sorts of jobs. There's so many construction opportunities. For example, I, I just want to point out, too, the average age of construction worker in the state of Vermont is 54 years old. So there's a gap here. There's opportunities for people to work in this state and stay here, uh, especially younger people coming out of high school. So. Hey, thank you, Paul. For the next question, the order will be Ann Watson, Andrew Perchlick, Ann Cummings, Paul Bean, Dexter LeFevre. And this topic has already come up. I knew it would before we even got to it. But uh, this is about housing. So first, the context, then second, the question. So the context. We are in the midst of a housing, housing crisis in Vermont. Housing prices are up, mortgage rates are up, rents are up, and there are not enough available units to rent or to buy. Anecdotally, we have heard of teachers and others from out of state accepting jobs here only to back out when they couldn't find a place to live. Housing is a widespread problem, but it is especially hard on low-income and moderate-income Vermonters. The question, do you think the, that the Vermont legislature should do more to support housing, and especially to support affordable housing? If so, what? So, Anne, you're first. Sure, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, housing is certainly on my radar as a, an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, I think uh, in, in addition to the Act 250's reform, uh, 250 reform that I mentioned uh, earlier that I think would uh, really help with uh, building in already impacted downtowns, uh, I would love to uh, see us uh, work on a couple of things. One is uh, thinking about that a lot of our housing is actually um, vacant right now. We actually have quite a few uh, houses here that are second homes. Uh, I would love to see us uh, restructure uh, the, the tax bracket so that there is the possibility of taxing second homes and very large homes at a higher rate uh, because those are folks that we know can probably afford uh, to pay a little more. And so I would love to see us uh, uh, be able to uh, alleviate the burden on uh, regular Vermonters. And then I think we could potentially use that tax uh, money to go towards uh, more affordable housing. Uh, second thing, uh, I'm very interested in what Burlington has done in terms of uh, the regulating Airbnbs uh, and using the money there to go towards affordable housing as well. There's more I would love to say, but I'm basically out of time. Lots of thoughts on this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Andrew. Yeah, I think, you know, the legislature has worked on this. We've done a lot, but it takes time is one of the things. But I know that's, it's not a solution in the short term, but we've put a lot of things in place, but it's, it's 
takes time to build these houses and put everything in place to get the money out there on the streets, so to speak. I do support what Mayor Watson said about the Act 250 reform for downtowns. We want to have smart growth. We need more housing, and if the more we can do it in a smart way, the better. I also support the refurbishment program. I can't remember what it's called, but as we, in our towns and as we drive around the district, we see those homes that are vacant but not livable, and landlords, you know, some that I've talked to said, I can't, aff the amount of money that I would take to, to refurbish this to make it a livable unit, I won't be able to recover in the rents. It would be too expensive. And so that the program that we have that supports landlords to make those houses livable, I think is a great program because these are buildings that we want to upgrade anyway, and it can happen a lot quicker than it takes somebody to build a new house or build a new apartment building. That takes a long time. So I think just getting those units on online are, are a really good way. Um, yeah, I think that's that's, okay. <laughs> that's that's about it. Thank you, Andrew. Ann Cummings. Okay. Um, I think first we need to define what we mean by affordable. The state put hundreds of millions of dollars into its federal money into fed into affordable housing this year. But that's generally subsidized housing. That those rents are gonna have to be subsidized because the people that are in them can't afford to pay the rents that would cover the cost of building them. We have another affordable, which I think we're talking about now, which is worker housing. And uh, the, the basic slab ranch, you know, the first starter home or the home um, that older people on fixed incomes could move down to. We haven't built enough of those. Variety of reasons. One of them is we have been very reluctant to give up any kind of open space to build more housing. We, we, those of us that got here and got our house, we don't like anyone coming in. I think we're going to have to have a serious discussion about that. I think uh, the numbers I've heard is that you can't build a house for under 300,000 and the average family can afford two to 250. Why is that? Do we do state bulk buying for raw materials? What's, you know, how often do you get a market demand and the market doesn't fill it? So I think we need to have some serious discussions with the people that are building houses and come up with a plan. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Paul. Sure. Um, you're never going to believe it, but I think we need to look at Act 250. I think we need to, I think, and I think everybody kind of knows that this is a problem, at least from what I've gathered, is maybe Act 250 re reform might be a good idea. Um, I think we have to think about how the way that it's structured, uh, at least from when I talk to, to builders and developers, they say, you know, we're, re we're very picky about the projects that we choose to pursue, uh, essentially because, uh, you know, they're, they're concerned if they work or try to go after a project that's too big, um, it's going to trigger Act 250. And going through Act 250 can be very expensive. It can be very uh, t timely. You know, it, it costs a lot of time, too. Uh, and you might never see any of that money back if you can't get the permit. Um, so unfortunately, I think it makes them very picky about the projects that they choose to pursue. And I think what we need to do and what I think I can do as a state senator is get together with local state governments, lo or state governments, local governments, uh, community stakeholders, builders, developers, contractors, and we're going to build a coalition of people that are, that are concerned with, with this and how can we take Act 250 and look at actual reasonable ways to reform it while keeping in mind that uh, the state is beautiful and we want to keep, keep in mind the environmental impacts of any type of development, whether it's commercial or residential. So that would be my take on Thank you, Paul. Of course. Dexter. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, housing is just a really complex issue. There is no one course that we can take to uh, uh, correct the current housing crisis that we have now. I think that one of the real things that's driving the severity of the problem right now, it's sort of a perfect storm with ARPA spending and government spending in general. We have an influx of money. We have a limited ability to build new homes, and the money has diverted the workforce from affordable homes or lower cost homes into 
uh, high cost subsidized housing at a much higher cost, a much higher standard than a, than a res standard residential home, and that there's no workforce available to work to build lower cost housing right now. And I think the, that we need to sort of temper government spending uh, to soften the market. Um, the other thing that's happened is as a result of COVID, and this was happening even before COVID, but there's a, a migration of people from the cities uh, buying land at high prices. Uh, that's driven up the cost of housing. Um, the, uh, the regulatory climate that we have is difficult, it's complex, it's unpredictable. That drives up the process. Um, and um, you know, rent subsidies as well. If someone can afford X amount of rent, but suddenly they get a subsidy of X plus 500, the rent goes to X plus 500. All those things drive up the cost of housing and, and make it difficult for people to find homes. Thank you, Dexter. So as I'm listening to your answers, I'm having reactions here. I want to add something or say, yeah, and you know what? <laughs> I appreciate your responses. And I, I imagine pe people watching are having responses like that too. So thanks for your thoughtful answers. And for the next question, the order will be Ann Cummings, Paul, Ann Watson, Dexter, and Andrew. No surprise on this one that this would come up. So this question is about Article 22, the proposed personal reproductive liberty amendment to the Vermont Constitution. It is, the, the amendment is one sentence written without commas and in legal terminology. So I, I'll read it to you. So that an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. And the question is, where do you stand on this article? So, Anne, you're first. Okay, I was on the Health and Welfare Committee that drafted and worked on that article. Um, I did vote for it. Um, Vermont law right now does protect a woman's right to choose, but this was done before Roe v. Wade was overturned, but there was a lot of concern that it would be. This puts that general principle into the Vermont Constitution. Like other constitutional guarantees, no right is absolute. And I'm, before I came tonight, I was trying to answer somebody that wanted to know, you know, why doesn't it mention women? Because it also covers men. How that works out um, in this country, in uh, our constitutional form, is that we can write laws to define it. Uh, people can do court challenges to it. It will go through a court process, but it will have to come up against that basic principle of reproductive liberty. But no right is absolute. Um, we've made some changes to the right to bear arms recently um, because it was a compelling government interest. Um, right now, uh, medical ethics does not allow for a late-term abortion, except in the case of uh, threat to the mother's life or the non-viability of the child. Um, if that were to change, then we could write a law that would specify that. But at this point, it was felt that that wasn't necessary. Okay. Thank you, Ann. Paul. So I'll start by saying that I believe in a woman's right to choose. I believe in reproductive liberty, and I believe in bodily autonomy. And I do believe that it is essential human right that our health care choices are kept between the patient and the provider. And I think that's kind of where I want to leave it at that. I think, I think I've said what needs to be said. I support Article 22, and I think going forward, uh, it's important that people do too. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Ian. Yeah, thank you. So as uh, a person who has recently been pregnant, um, I feel like I can say uh, pregnancy is uh, certainly a very uh, intimate and personal uh, experience and really does not have 
uh, any business for uh, the government interfering with it. And so uh, I am um, proudly supporting Article 22. I uh, am very uh, uh, you know, supportive of uh, women being able to make the best decisions that they can for, uh, for their bodies between them and, and their doctor and their families and what makes sense uh, for them. Um, and uh, one of the other things that I appreciate, uh, appreciate about Article 22 is uh, that it also uh, addresses uh, uh, forced sterilization. Vermont has a terrible history with that. Uh, and so that, that is also something that should not ever happen again. Uh, and so I'm, I'm grateful for um, the, the reproductive liberty aspect of this, that it's in inclusive uh, of that idea as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, that is, that's all I, I think okay. I need to say on that also. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Dexter. Yeah, uh, well, I think I agree with uh, most who have spoken. Uh, you know, I certainly support a woman's right to choose. Um, um, and I just want to read the Article 22 again because, like, I, I see a disconnect between the first part of the language and the second part of the language. And, and I really clearly support the first part of the language, the first 28 words that are, that an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed. I think that's great. This is, the remaining 12 words scare me, though. And it goes, I think, to what Anne was talking about, about the historic history of uh, forced sterilization in Vermont. And these are the, the final 12 words. Unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. Mm -hmm. And I just have a real concern that that could be opened up to things such as forced sterilization, for, uh, things such as giving uh, a father a right over uh, the reproductive rights of a mother because uh, this is not gender specific. So I think uh, there's a lot of concerns with the language that's there. Uh, the bottom line is that the voters are going to decide on, on Article 22 and uh, I support uh, um, democracy and I support people's uh, opinions and uh, get out there and vote. Thank you. Thank you, Dexter. Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of Proposition 5, Article 22. Like Senator Cummings, I voted for it in the legislature. We had to vote for it twice. You know, we voted for it in the 1920 biennium, and then we had an election after that vote, and those people that got reelected got a, vote, a chance to vote for it again if they wanted to reconsider it. So it passed through two legislative bodies, separate legislative bodies, and now it's going in front of the people. I, I've already voted for it. I think it's important, even though we do have the statutory protection of reproductive liberty for women, we need to get the third branch of government involved. There is an unfortunate tr trend in, in other states of people trying to just change the law. If we just had a law, then it w wouldn't be protected by the Constitution, and just the, the, a new legislature could come in and change it. So I want to have that production. Pr protection of the third branch of government to, to, to make sure that if any law that gets passed in the future per, protects that right to choose and that reproductive liberty. And I think that's what the, the language says and that's what will happen. And I think it's clear from the intent of the legislature and all the debate that happened in Senator Cummings' committee and throughout the both bodies that it was clear what the intent was and that will be used by the courts in the future. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, for the next question, the order will be Andrew, Dexter, Paul, Ann Watson, Ann Cummings. Um, this question, again, the context first, and then the question. So the con this is about LGBTQ plus protections. And I'm going to take that plus in a broad, a broad sense, as you'll see. Many, if not most Vermonters, say they believe in the equal and equitable treatment of all people. However, we regularly see examples of black Vermonters, other people with darker than white skin, or foreign accents, or less common religions, indigenous Vermonters, or members of our LGBTQ plus communities targeted or threatened. Just last week, in one of these forums in this very studio, um, the sole black candidate seeking to represent Montpelier in the Vermont State House said he does not campaign door-to-door -door because of the reaction he expects 
from 30 to 40 percent of those answering doors. We have periodically had incidents of the vandalizing and burning of Black Lives Matter, rainbow, and trans signs or flags. And then the question, should the legislature strengthen Vermont's bias and hate crime statutes? So Andrew, you first. Yeah, I think on the face of it, the, the quick answer would be yes. I haven't looked into that, so I don't have a specific example about the, the crime aspect. We, we did pass two laws while I've been in there about uh, panic defense laws that have happened in cases where people have murdered or attacked um, either gay or trans people, and, and, and they've said that they just they panicked, and that was their defense because they were just so shocked to be approached by somebody like that. We took that defense away from them in the, in the court of law, so they can't use that anymore. So I think things like that we need to pass. We did definitely need to make our schools uh, more affirming. We've had some examples in sporting events over the last couple of years mm -hmm. with people being uh, yelled at by the fans uh, for their racial identity or their sexual identity. And I think the School Principals Association that monitors sports needs to, to do a better job of, of, of making sure that doesn't continue and that all of our athletes are, feel safe going out there and, and playing a sports, which I think is, is a great uh, you know, activity for, for our school children, but they need to be able to do it safely. And yeah, we have a, we, we have a problem in Vermont with, with racism and transphobia and queerphobia and you know, even anti-Semitism, and, and something that we need to address. We did uh, pass a law about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that's just kind of getting its work started, but I think part of their work will be to study this and really lay out all the, the problems in some of our, our history that we can learn from. Thank you, Andrew. Dexter. Uh, so I appreciate uh, Andrew's input there, and pleased to hear that uh, the legislature has taken some actions to, uh, you know, tighten uh, the laws around um, racism and transphobic, uh, uh, LGB, anything really um, uh, inequitable towards anyone of any type of minority. Um, and I, I would support, you know, more limits where it makes sense. Um, again, I, don't, I, I do see that uh, racism is a problem in Vermont. Um, and I do see uh, that uh, systemic racism exists uh, within our government. And I think that this is an area where government can really lead by example. I feel that um, the, uh, the schools um, could do better. Um, you know, again, I think with systemic racism, our, our government is, is a bad example. We really lack uh, people of minorities, all, t all sorts of minorities at all levels in government. I'm not talking elected, but I mean um, government staff, government employees aren't necessarily representative of, of the community. Uh, the schools especially need to uh, do that. So that's an area where the teachers unions are at fault. Uh, I don't, don't, don't feel that they really accurately represent the population. Um, I also think that uh, bullying that goes on at the school level is something that uh, can be corrected and again an opportunity where government can lead by example schools and elsewhere thank you thank you dexter paul sure uh, i first off i'd like to say I'm, I'm first of all very proud to be from a state where i think overall people are pretty open-minded uh, when it comes to things like uh, race gender sexual orientation um, but i'm not going to pretend like that i don't know about uh, some racism or prejudice that exists towards all types of, of people, all types of minorities. Um, and I think that's it's really upsetting. Um, but I would also add that my generation, I think overall, is pretty um, open to this stuff too. I think that you're not seeing in my generation as much racism or discrimination towards uh, people of different sexual orientation, race, gender, again. Um, and I think I also appreciate Andrew's input because I, I'm not, I, I don't know much about um, what's been done in the legislature. And I think that anything going forward where, where I can help support 
uh, a fellow human being and their experience on, in this crazy thing called life. You know, uh, doesn't matter what what they um, how they identify themselves. I think it's very important that we take a look, especially uh, in a state that is overwhelmingly white. Uh, that we take a look at, at how we can help people of, of color, people that are in minority classes, what, what, what have you. You know, I, I think I'm definitely somebody who is, who is open and willing and wants to support legislation like that. Thank you, Paul. Ian Watson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so to uh, answer the question pretty directly, I would certainly be interested in uh, looking at uh, strengthening Vermont's uh, bias and hate crime uh, laws. Uh, but. I guess I would also, uh, in addition to that, uh, point at three other uh, things that I think are, are worth examining. So, um, because beyond just punishing something, I think it's important to do the work to try to help uh, people understand their, their own implicit biases. Uh, and that, that takes intention and time and, and digging. And so I would love to see the state support uh, implicit bias training uh, across a variety of sectors. Uh, I would like to see us uh, support uh, positively the, the teaching of uh, actual history in classrooms, making sure that uh, we are we're teaching uh, our, everything <laughs> that is truly a part of history, even if it is embarrassing for, for white people, right? Like that is um, something that we need to be honest about and, uh, and learn from. And then the last thing I would suggest is uh, I think we need to be uh, intentional about uh, examining the systems that our government's had. Something that we've done in Montpelier is had an uh, equity assessment done, and I think that could be beneficial at the state level because our systems really were built uh, for and by wealthy, straight, white people. So, uh, and actually mostly men. <laughs> I'll throw that in there as well. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ann. And Ann Cummings. And me. Um, we've done a, a lot with the law. We may have done as much as we, we can at this point. The law tells you what you can't do. But what we're really talking about, and you're bringing up all my old sociology training, is prejudice and bias and how people feel about people who are different than they are. We can, the law can tell you how you can act on those feelings. But what we're really talking about is how do you change those feelings? You know, how do you, um, make people understand that the people that don't look like you really are something like you. But, um, you know, but they also have a different culture and maybe different traditions and to learn to respect those. And I think that that's where the challenge is for us. I think we can start in the schools, but I think you're going to find that the kids yelling epithets at ball games are hearing those words at home. Um, how, how do you get that kind of a discussion? And it takes some courage for the, the people that are being victimized and to speak out to their classmates or to their um, fellow citizens about how that works. Um, I think that's, that's the really big challenge for us. It's not the law. It's it's really how we feel about each other. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Uh, for the next question, the order will be Paul, Ann Cummings, Dexter, Andrew, and Ann Watson. And it, the question is about the labor shortage. The governor and many others have frequently said that we need to attract new families and workers to Vermont and do a better job of keeping our own young people here. What can the legislature do to attract and keep workers in Vermont. And Paul, you get to start. Sure. So first off, I'd like to point out, once again, we obviously have a workforce crisis. Um, 20,000 jobs short in workforce uh, participation. That's different than unemployment. Um, so 20,000 people who are not participating in the workforce less. And I think than, than uh, numbers previous to, actually, I think it was even before COVID, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think what we have to do 
is we have to get together with uh, where, where, where are jobs needed the most, right? And where I'm hearing from people is there's a lack of tradesmen. I don't know if you've tried to get a plumber or an electrician to your house lately, um, but it sometimes takes a while. And I think this comes back to workforce development. What are we doing with our youth? Are we setting them up for success? Are we setting them up with the skills that they need to be able to stay in this state and take a job, you know, whether it's uh, working as uh, uh, bussing tables or if you're working uh, as an electrician or if you're working uh, at a ski area, for example, are we giving them the skills that they need to uh, not only work that job, but be able to take the income that they have, afford to live here, and uh, essentially set themselves up with a life here. And I can tell you from experience, it's very difficult to do that right now in the state of Vermont, especially as a young person. And I think when we look at workforce development, we need to think about our youth and uh, solving this workforce crisis by attracting people to also come to this state with these types of skills. And I see that I run out of time, but I could talk about okay. this all day. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Ian Cummings. Okay. Point out, uh, three of my four children did stay in Vermont, um, <laughs> and they went to school here because they liked the lifestyle. And the fourth would come back if he could make as much money as he makes in Montreal. Um, you know, I won't even have this discussion about do rich people or kids leave the state and for what reasons, because some people leave maybe for jobs. I know others leave because they would like to see a big city. We're a small rural state that, you know, how are you going to keep them on the farm after they've seen Paris is, is, is a real thing. The question is, do they go out for a few years and then come back when they're ready to settle down? So we need to keep Vermont as a desirable place. I think we need to do a better job of marketing Vermont as a desirable place. We need to work with our business community to make sure that they make enough profit in order to be able to afford to pay the wages and the benefits that we would like them to pay. I think we need, again, to say, OK, this is our problem. How do we solve it? How do we all come together? You leave the, you know, the uh, pat political decisions outside the door, you know, and we sit down and we say, all right, this is it. How do we reach that young, that portion of young people that are n just outside the workforce? They just okay. don't work. How do we get to them? Thank you, Ian. Dexter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, geez, I think Anne just characterized things uh, very much the same way I do. And I, I think that maybe where I have a different approach is in, this, in the solution. Um, you know, historically now, for the last 20 plus years, uh, we've uh, tried to solve our problems by throwing money at it. And that just doesn't work. Uh, money, spending at state level, um, taxing and trying to solve these problems uh, with more spending. Um, is driving up the cost of living. And affordability is definitely part of the reason that keeps young people out here. She's correct, that, uh, and, I, and I agree, that uh, many people leave Vermont for the city because that's where they want to live. And, you know, and I am the first to say that Vermont is not right for everyone. Vermont is right for me. I'm into it deep, uh, deep, 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 and, and I love it here. Uh, I can't wait for winter, um, but I'm one of those nuts. Um, but anyway, again, I think it's affordability, especially, you know, I think the demographic problem that we have around jobs is uh, really going to be solved with young people. Uh, we've already got the, like Paul said, the average age of a construction work worker is 54 years old. We're not going to bring that down with old people, right? Um, so we need to find a way to attract young people and to keep our young people that want to stay here. And, it's, and realizing that Vermont's not right for everyone. Uh, but it is, it, we do have a lifestyle here that's really awesome. So uh, marketing that and making it apparent to others is a good way to attract people as well. Thank you, Dexter. Andrew. Yeah, I, I think it's an important to, just to say something about the, the, the question. I agree that the workforce situation is a crisis, and we have a huge problem with all of our employees finding the workers that they want to find. Um, but I don't think it's because youth people are leaving the state. I think the question is, like, how do we keep workers here? 
Uh, I think there, it's kind of a myth that a lot of young people leave the state. A lot of young people do leave the state, but a lot of young people leave all the states. Like if you go to New Hampshire, Maine, other New England, other states, people leave uh, other states. It's just something that, that a, lot, a lot of young people want to do, want to try things to do. We have a lot of young people that move back to the Vermont. And the, so the statistics that I have seen do not show that that's specifically the problem. And I, I bring that up just because I don't want us to focus on the wrong solution. Like trying to keep them here really isn't, I think, but I agree with what other people have said is like, how do we encourage them when they do come back or if they decide not to leave, f find a meaningful career here. And I uh, agree with Paul that it's the trades is a, is a great w place to expand the workforce, not just the traditional tra trades, the construction workers, the plumbers and electricians that we need, but the digital entrepreneurs and other uh, uh, you know, artistic trades that we, we could have people go into. I think our trade schools are underappreciated and underfunded, and we could do a lot more to bring more people into those schools and support them. But, but like Paul, I could say more, but I ran out of time. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Ann Watson. Yeah, thank you. So I've got three solutions that I would love to talk about. One is uh, child care. So uh, just in knocking on doors, talking to folks uh, about issues on their mind, it is not uncommon to hear that people are spending twenty to forty thousand dollars on on child care, especially if they have multiple children. Uh, that is that's a, a tough burden for anybody, and at that scale, uh, families are having to have uh, really hard conversations about is it worth it to uh, to put a, a kid in childcare or to stay home. So uh, where are the workers, at least some of them, are home taking care of their kids. And so I think having a universal um, pre-K, having more uh, high quality affordable childcare accessible uh, just across Vermont uh, would be beneficial in bringing back some folks to the workforce. Second thing, um, we used to have a program, maybe we still do, I'm not sure, uh, about uh, paying folks to move to Vermont. I think if we can pay people to to move here, then I think we can also afford to look at paying people, paying uh, to keep people here. And one of the uh, forms I'd like us to look at is in the form of debt relief. So uh, certainly, uh, students leave the state and then come back. Uh, I, I was one of those as well, uh, and so. But being able to provide debt relief uh, is would be, I think, really attractive uh, to a lot of uh, graduates. And and the third thing, um, which I am out of time for, I will just say Woodstock has an interesting model around um, potentially looking at uh, housing trusts. Okay, thank you, Anne. For the next question, the order will be Dexter. Ann Watson, Andrew, Ann Cummings, and Paul. Um, and this question is about climate change. As early as the 1970s, scientists began warning us that human behaviors were significantly changing the climate. With each decade, the evidence has gotten stronger and the, effect, the effects have gotten worse. While this is a global problem, Vermont and Vermonters contribute to it. Do you believe Vermont should take additional steps to limit carbon emissions? And Dexter, you get to go first. So the simple short answer is, is yes. I think Vermont should take simple steps. Um, and a word that I've used over and over uh, tonight is sensible. And I think with energy policy that's driven to uh, come back, combat uh, climate change, I think that uh, our policies could be more sensible. I'm going to bring back the example of Efficiency Vermont, where we um, tax all people 6% of their electrical consumption and then take that money and offer it in rebates. Uh, it also goes to weatherization, which is a great cause. Um, but basically, it, it takes, it's a regressive tax. And it takes the m money from the people who, who can afford it the least and gives it to the people who need it the least. Um, so we're putting. Um, solar panels on wealthy people's houses at the expense of low-income pe people. And that's just not sensible policy. Um, but I th again, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, there are areas where the state can lead by example. And I think that uh, this is a good uh, place for the state to lead by example. We can uh, take action in state buildings. We can educate um, Vermonters 
across different sectors about what things they can do to change, uh, uh, to combat climate change. And uh, we can be informative and uh, uh, encourage people to do, to do the right thing. Most people do want to do the right thing if they can afford it. But most of our policies to date are contributing significantly to the unaffordability here. Okay, thank you, Dexter. Ann Watson. Yeah, thank you. I have a lot of uh, thoughts about this. Uh, so one of the things that I've been uh, talking a lot about during this campaign is something called the split incentive, where uh, renters who are paying for heat may be stuck paying high prices for oil because they have um, uh, their landlords have no financial incentive to make energy improvements uh, to the home. So uh, with a system that is broken like that, I, I see an opportunity for uh, the government to step in, and uh, I, I would love to see us be able to uh, craft a, a program for landlords to be able to transition off of fossil fuels and weatherize their homes uh, without ideally jacking up the rents. So um, that's uh, uh, going to take uh, some some government intervention, and I think that that will be um, really important for, for the, our renting community. Uh, which, by the way, at least in Montpelier, is uh, something like 40% um, of the uh, uh, housing units. Uh, on uh, uh, other uh, topics there, uh, there's, I, I would love to see us um, have more electric vehicles and charging stations. I'm really excited about the federal money that is coming our direction for that. I would love to see us uh, adopt the uh, Clean Cars and Trucks uh, 2 uh, initiative uh, that's coming out of California. I think we're on track, hopefully, to do that. Um, and one of the reasons that's important is because of storage. If we're going to have more solar and wind, uh, we need to be able to store it better. And so uh, in order to make it equitable, um, it, it's actually very useful to have that in the form of our cars. Uh, so more I could say on that, but I'll leave it there. Thanks. OK. Thank you, Ann. Andrew. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I've been working on this issue basically the, my whole professional career in Vermont, and it's what I do in my day job as the director of the Clean Energy Development Fund. And I think it's it's important for me that we focus on the economics of the of the issue. Uh, focusing on the greenhouse gases is important, but I think sometimes where we we focus too much uh, on the you know, metric tons of carbon, and we kind of forget some of the economics, as Dexter said, like affordability. We, the transition to a clean energy economy has to be affordable and a just transition, but I think that's totally doable. I think we also spend a lot of time talking about electricity, but from our carbon perspective and energy perspective, although I, it'll grow, it's not where our problem lies. Where we have the biggest problem and the most you know, opportunities is in our thermal or, or heating our buildings and our homes and in transportation. And I'm particularly in interested in how we heat and unfortunately we'll be cooling our homes more and more as it gets warmer. Air conditioning didn't used to be a thing in Vermont, but you see it more and more. Is in particularly, I have a lot of confidence and uh, hope for advanced wood heating. Vermont has a rich history of forest products. I want to keep the forest products industry healthy in the state. And we can use the wood from our forest products sector to heat, to get rid of fossil fuels for our homes and heat in a way that has low emissions and is, is much more affordable than importing fossil fuels. Thank you, Andrew. Ann Cummings. OK. Um, the committee that I chair regulates utilities. So I've been in the weeds in this for a long time. Um, when we started, there's a, a balance going on here. Right now, the viable alternative fuel we have is electricity. When we started this, when I was a freshman, not a veteran, um, Vermont had the highest uh, electric rates in the country. And um, in New England, and New England has the highest electric rates in the country, mostly because we didn't have a whole lot of coal. Um, we are now the lowest, and a lot of that is efficiency Vermont. We get, forget the exact name, but we get credit and we're therefore money from the grid because we have cut the need to develop future generation plants because we're using less. We're using that money to weatherize and to help other people. I think 
we're all suddenly focused and we all want to do something here in Vermont to solve what is a global issue. And I think, and we have limited resources. I, I think we might do better if we kind of focus that and said, you know, folks that got to drive home in mud season out a dirt road might not be able to afford an electric pickup truck. So maybe we could focus on the areas, the, the more urban areas that have paved roads um, and work, you know, just keep working through those more concentrated and then move out. Okay. Thank you, Ann. And Paul? Sure. Um, I think we have to take action to mitigate climate change and there is certainly climate phenomena taking place that is causing so much of our uh, natural disasters for example rain amounts there's certainly been an increase of precipitation uh, within the past few years and i think that's something we need to take very seriously um, should we limit carbon emissions um, absolutely i think if we're going to be Heading further into the future, it's obvious to me that uh, electric vehicles are a way that we can do that. I think it's awesome that the state of Vermont it produces 100% renewable electricity. I think that's something to really be proud of. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, we, we have to make sure that when we're plugging in our electric vehicles, that we're plugging our electric vehicles into uh, renewable energy sources. And when we're buying electricity from out of state, it's not always renewable electricity. Because yes, the state of Vermont, it's 100% of what we produce is, is renewable, but our usage, uh, a lot of it comes from out of state and is not renewable. And I think uh, when it comes to uh, renewable energy, we have to increase our electrical capacity. We need the workforce to increase our electrical capacity. Right now, we don't have that. Uh, and if we're going to do that, it comes back to workforce development. It also comes back to environmental stewardship. So how can we build our economy going forward and increase our electrical capacity uh, and go the direction that we need to do to create electrical, uh, excuse me, create, create electrical infrastructure combined with the, the needed workforce to, to get us there. So, okay. thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, for the next question, the order will be Ian Watson, Andrew, Ann Cummings, Paul, and Dexter. And this is about education funding in Act 46. Again, context and then the question. Uh, getting education funding right has been an ongoing topic since before any of us here were born. So has been keeping education costs down. In recent decades, we have also tried to equalize educational opportunities so students in less affluent communities can have schooling experiences on par with those in wealthier communities. We love our local, often small schools but they can be expensive to run. Vermont has among the highest per capita education costs in the nation. Act 46 tried to encourage a more coordinated approach that would increase efficiencies. It was one of the goals. So the question, do we need to change Act 46 or anything else about the way we fund or manage education for, uh, for our young Vermonters? And Ian, you get to go first. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, so Act 46, I think, was uh, pretty problematic uh, for a lot of communities. I, I understand the problem and the reason why uh, it uh, was uh, appealing and seemed like a good idea. I um, uh, agree that our education spending is very expensive, uh, but I think that there are potentially other solutions. Uh, so and, uh, so I, I think the idea of forcing school districts to merge, that was that was. Uh, pretty tough, and I would actually um, like to uh, see that there might be a pathway for districts that merged that maybe it was actually illogical for them to, to merge uh, a pathway for them to, to unmerge uh, if that uh, seems uh, fit to both communities. So um, that's one thing. And then uh, in terms of an alternative, because our small schools are expensive to fund, um, I would love to see us explore the possibility of income-based um, funding instead of property tax uh, based funding for uh, to support our ed education system, and I know that that would be um, a major overhaul, but I think it warrants uh, examination, and um, I think has a lot of uh, potential. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Andrew. 
Yeah, thanks. I've been in the last four years been on the education committee and got a lot of education. I still can't explain the education funding formula, but even folks that have been chair of the education committees can't explain it. So it's one of the things I would like to do is figure out how to make it a little simpler. I because I like a lot of Vermonters, I like our small local schools and I like that we have local votes and local control over the schools, but I understand the difficulties that that makes when you're trying to control spending. Uh, we passed bills last year that, that did find a way to, to lay out a way for schools to separate if they, if they want to, because when Act was written, it didn't really explain exactly how that goes and that hasn't gone well. Uh, we also set up a committee to look at the income-based funding. Both Senator Cummings and I are on that summer committee, although it's turning into a fall committee. We're doing you know, just from now till the next session, studying how, how we could move more towards income or totally to an income-based education fund instead of a property tax. We already have income sensitivity to the property tax, but this would make it even more so and, and more equitable. Last year, we did the pupil weighting that is going to make it more equitable uh, statewide. And we're, we've done, a, a, you know, like you've said, we've tried many things over the years to keep tinkering with it. I think some, some of the folks, including the teachers and schools, they have like, just take a break, quit uh, changing things every year. Um, but one specific thing I think we can do to help a little bit is we suspended the excess spending threshold that schools was one of the ways that we could govern uh, too much spending at the local level. Uh, but we suspended that for a couple of years because of some of the Act 46 things. So we should make sure that that gets back in place. Thank you, Andrew. Ann Cummings. Okay. I'm going to have to plead guilty. Um, <laughs> I chaired education when we did Act 46. <laughs> uh, finance is eye deep in one of our areas is the education fund and the property tax. And I am co-chairing the uh, committee that is looking into going more to, edu to uh, income. Um, I think what we're, we're seeing in Vermont is that we have a tradition of small, very small local schools. We like our local schools. We like our local school boards having control over them. But we had a situation where those small local schools frequently in poor communities could not afford to give their children an adequate education. We have some real uh, problems in just uh, the conditions of school buildings because communities are poor. And Act 60 has done what it was supposed to. A penny on the tax rate raises the same amount in every town. But we do still have a a question as to how do we adequately fund those, how do we protect, um, you know, the, what we like, but at the same time provide the education that students need to survive in the 21st century. I mean, you, you got to have computers, you should all have classes in robotics, you know. I mean, how, if you don't know what's out there, how is for jobs, how do we get you there? So, okay. uh, and I think we should alter any <laughs> law that uh, I as we get experience dealing with it. Thank you, Ann. Um, Paul. So, uh, having not been too far removed from the school systems in the state of Vermont, um, I could just tell you a little bit about my experience with this. Yeah. I remember when I was going through middle school, I had some some friends who decided uh, going into high school, you know, I'm actually going to school choice elsewhere. I'm going to go to U32 or I'm going to go to Spalding or uh, even down to, to Randolph at the tech center. Um, and then as we got further into my high school experience, uh, the sports teams unified for Williamstown and Northfield, which was awful. It wasn't actually, but it was, it was, a, it was kind of a rivalry, you know, so we're, we're thinking, well, where is this going? Is this, is this going to be, continue to be a theme? Um, and then the districts merged. And then, you know, I remember while I was in school, we, I remember asking teachers, a friend of mine specifically asked a teacher, you know, if we're going to merge these two districts, does that not mean that we're going to have, you know, half the amount of teachers, half the amount of people uh, working in the schools, and still the same amount of students to take care of? Um, and I guess where I'm going with this is, uh, I think we need to look at what has been done in the past, uh, and I think 
Sure, you know, maybe it's a little bit romantic, but I love the idea of, of especially in the elementary schools, these small little uh, schoolhouses and, and publicly funded, you know, and, and you have small community schools, cooperative uh, uh, people, families going to school together. Um, and then as we get further heading into high school, you can, do have the opportunity to send students to schools like Spalding and Randolph and U32 with, where there are more options. You know, Northfield, as you may know, mm -hmm. It was not exactly full of, uh, of vibrant extracurricular activities from sports to some of the classes that were taught. And more of them were slashed and cut away as I got further into high school. And I think that, that was uh, problematic. And even now, they're still cutting. So that would be my take on that. OK. Thank you, Paul. Sure. And Dexter. Yeah, so the focus of the question was on funding. And um, there are some issues, I think, with the current funding program. I, th I think in a lot of ways um, it is an income tax that's disguised as a, as a property tax because of the income sensitivity uh, at lower income levels, right? Until you reach hundred or $150,000 a year, family income, you only have to pay 10% max of, of uh, property tax. So uh, it's, I think it's partly already uh, an income tax, but disguised as something else. Uh, but I think the real issue is funding, and I and I like what Paul mentioned about the and what you mentioned as well about the uh, the uh, feel good aspects of the small schoolhouse. And I think that Vermont needs to reinvent the education system. I think the most sacred connection in school is that between a teacher and a student. And as much as the le as the decisions can be made about how to proceed are made at that level, uh, the better off we will be. Um, 250 years of centralization, um, and in the last few years, centralization on steroids has, has hurt uh, the education system. Uh, it sort of breeds the, um, the bullying and the bad experiences that minorities feel in these large in institutions. And I think if it just went backwards to, a, to smaller schools, uh, community-based, uh, one teacher, one-room schoolhouses, I think you get a great educational experience. Homeschooling is putting out some awesome, awesome children. Um, and all that should be embraced. There's no one size fits all uh, for education. And, and the system needs to be more flexible. Thank you, Dexter. This has been the hardest question for me to not jump in on, <laughs> <laughs> having worked in Vermont for schools <laughs> for over 30 years. And, and uh, while I was at U32 as an English teacher and then as assistant principal, I had uh, two of Dexter's children. Um, two different experiences. And then, um, <laughs> and then later on when I was principal of Northfield High School, Paul was, was in the middle school. So that's, uh, and in another district, I worked on, uh, on school mergers. So it's all wonderful, very interesting, and challenging stuff. It's, it's really wonderful. So we have time for one more question, then closing statements. So what we're going to do now is some of you have regularly run over a little bit, and some others have always been under. So we're going to even it out. We'll skip one. No, we won't skip anyone. No. <laughs> but everybody will be really good, because we're, we're short on time now. So the last question is about federal COVID money. So as quickly as you can, and then, you know, and then we'll get to closing statements. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, Vermont has received much more federal money than usual. It is a temporary influx of cash. How will, a Vermont, how will Vermont adjust when those extra federal dollars dry up? And the order this time is going to be Ann Cummings, Paul, Ann Watson, Dexter, and Andrew. So Ann Cummings first. I chaired the Joint Fiscal Committee, which has to approve all grants, and that federal money was a grant. So. Um, we set it up so that there were emergency funds immediately available, and then a second tranche we had to get permission. But the bulk of that money went through the regular budgeting process, and it has all been committed for. Some of it's not being used and coming back, so it'll work its way through. Um, we have tried, and I think fairly successfully, not to put that money into ongoing expenses. We've tried, it's one-time money, we tried to do it as one-time expense. Um, 
we put money aside for uh, PCB cleanup in the schools because we had a surplus in the Ed Fund due to federal money. That's not, we don't have enough to clean it all up, we don't think, but it's, it's a nest egg. It's something that's there. I think the big challenge will be uh, getting the interest groups in the public to kind of focus back that we are not, we're not going to have that kind of influx going on. We're going back to what we fondly call the alligator jaw, which is our expenses just slightly exceed our income, and that's not if we have a recession. So that's going to be okay. the big challenge. Thank you, Ann. Paul. Uh, I think when it comes to COVID money and the money that has been brought into the state of Vermont, it's incredibly important that we are spending uh, that money on things that are going to last. Uh, infrastructure projects, uh, especially with, with climate change, we need to think about wastewater systems, we need to think about drainage systems. Uh, I think we need to spend money on our electrical capacity, our ability to produce electricity. And I think if we're going to, you know, first, you know, I would like to also just a shout out to, to our great legislators down in Washington, D.C., Peter Welch, uh, Bernie Sanders, and Patrick Leahy for, for doing such a great job and, and, and making sure that the COVID relief money that has come is, is now here. Um, but that, that is what, how I think it, our money is best spent. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Ann Watson. Yeah, thank you. I would say that the, as much as we can within the uh, boundaries, the, the strings attached to that money, um, I would like to see us set ourselves up uh, to uh, be able to save ourselves money in the future as well as uh, invest in uh, opportunities that are uh, that Vermont is going to reap rewards from um, on into the future. Um, that is, you know, things like, again, setting up uh, child care. Uh, folks may not think of child care as infrastructure, but I think it absolutely is. Um, but beyond that, once the money uh, has run out, really it's a question of uh, where are we getting our tax dollars from? And so I, I would like to uh, just point out that I think we ought to bring back uh, the fifth tax bracket uh, to tax the wealthiest Vermonters um, at a higher rate uh, as they can, they can afford it. And uh, similarly, as I mentioned previously, uh, I would love to see us be able to tax second homes and mansions at, at a, a different rate, uh, at, a, at a higher rate, so that, uh, again, we have enough money to, uh, to fund the, the projects and, and needs of uh, our everyday systems. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Dexter. I uh, want to first uh, commend uh, uh, Phil Scott, really, uh, for the budgeting process um, and the legislature. I think they've done a good job in, in trying to use the ARPA funds wisely, uh, one-time expenditures, and not setting ourselves up for budget failures in the future. Hopefully, when the funds dry up, that is indeed the case. I really think that the, uh, the effort to fund broadband to all corners of the state is really a, a wonderful thing. I think that'll go a long ways to uh, building the economy, uh, making Vermont more affordable from the standpoint of allowing people to uh, work from home, perhaps at a, lot, at a higher income rate, uh, and without the cost of transportation. That'll also have the benefit of helping the climate. So I think that uh, broadband investment is really, really a critical thing. That being said, uh, I have electricity at my farm, thanks to the REA. Um, which uh, is now probably 80 years old electrical infrastructure, and, and it, it looks at um, Washington Co-op has had a hard time keeping up with its infrastructure. I, I have a condemned pole uh, that my transformer sits on, so that uh, creates some interesting uh, hurdles. So uh, we do end up with uh, infrastructure that is difficult to af afford, um, so we need to, I think the state can take a lead in educating, working with communities and utilities to help ensure that we've got uh, infrastructure that lasts. Okay. Thank you, Dexter. And Andrew. Yeah, I think we did a good job at addressing the immediate COVID needs of those that had lost their jobs and couldn't pay rent, couldn't pay their electric bill, and that was essential to, to, to fix that economic harm. But as ever the other people have said, and I, what I think the legislature and the governor did was focus on those one-time expenditures that build the infrastructure that will make it more affordable in the future. One thing that I'm working on in my job in the state is using uh, COVID money or ARPA money to improve schools' ventilation systems and their heating systems and their efficiency of their HVAC systems 
because HVAC is tied to ventilation, it was eligible for COVID money, but we can do a lot within the whole HVAC system that's eligible, that's going to make it not only better for the students and the teachers that are working in those buildings, but cheaper to run. And I think that's an example of how we're using this money to make our, our lives better, but also will help us in the future to, to, to make it cheaper, more economical. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. So in a moment, we'll get to closing statements. There'll be, you have one minute on those. And the order will be Andrew, Dexter, Paul, Ann Watson, and Ann Cummings. And the uh, wonderful folks here at ORCA have suggested if you would like to address the audience here, that you could you know, speak to the camera in the center. Um, or you can look at me, whichever you would like to do. <laughs> so that's the camera. And uh, Andrew, you get to go first. Yeah, well, thanks first to ORCA. This is really important that these kind of events happen. There's not a lot of them. So I just thank, thank ORCA for doing it. Also, I want to thank the candidates. Uh, it's really important that we have candidates. There are Senate districts in the state that do not have competitive races. They're just like the two incumbents or something like that. So I think it's really a testament to the democracy here in the Washington district that at least all the times that I've been a candidate, there's been a strong showing of candidates. And I really want to take some time to say that. And just thanks to those that have viewed and that are taking this election seriously, looking at the candidates. Uh, I hope you give me one of your three votes. I'm very eager to continue to serve the district for another two years. And I look forward to communicating with voters in any which way you want to communicate, whether that be text or phone or social media or email or walking down the driveway and having a discussion. And I hope to do more of that in the next two years. Thank you, thank you Andrew. Dexter. Uh, thank you. I want to thank uh, Orca and the bridge for sponsoring this event and all the candidates for coming out. I want to thank everyone who's watching this video either live or later. Um, thank you for your interest. I really encourage uh, voters to, to get informed. Uh, you can get more information about my position on all these issues. I got a video probably on each of them already at uh, Dexter4VT.com. Um, I did want to focus a little bit on uh, reaching out to people of the district. Um, I'm in the process of visiting each uh, select board and city council in the district. I've got uh, nine more to go out of 23, and it's been, uh, it's been fun, a little bit of a road trip now and then, but I uh, appreciate getting out and trying to reach people. I've been to Braintree. I've even been to Braintree, <laughs> and I got a warm response there. Um, Stowe, I keep missing. They list their meetings as Monday night, but they actually meet on Tuesday. So that's been a challenge. But... I thank, again, everybody who's been involved in this for participating and ask you to uh, make informed decisions, do the research, and vote your will. Thank you. Thank you, Dexter. Paul. Certainly. I uh, just want to thank everyone for having me. Thank you, Orca Media. Thank you, the candidates. Uh, so I think we talked about a little bit earlier that uh, maybe it's not so true that some of our biggest issues in the state is, is our demographic issues, particularly when it comes to young people. But I can tell you anecdotally, that uh, we need more young people here. I can also tell you with statistics, statistics that we need more young people here. Um, there's recently a article that came out in Washington Post talking about brain drain and how Vermont actually exports the most amount of college graduates, uh, more, more than any other state in the country. And we're talking about people that we've attracted to the state and now we are losing them um, to opportunities elsewhere around the country. Um, I think it's really important that we, we set our, our, our youth up in the state for successful life here. I think that we need to teach people how to immerse themselves within their community, use the state as a home base and a launch pad. And also, how can we get people in this state to interact with the entire world and compete at a global level? Um, and I think that I'm running for office because I want to represent Washington County and I want to represent all of Washington County. And we can't continue to uh, elect only Democrats and progressives if we are to do that. So I hope that you'll give me one of your votes, possibly Dexter one of your votes, and uh, that would be wonderful. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Paul. Ian Watson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I also want to thank the, uh, the Bridge and Orca Media for hosting this. And thank you, Tom, for mediating. Um, thank you also <laughs> all to all the candidates. Uh, and I just want to, um, as a part of uh, my closing statements here, uh, just recognize that one of the issues that has come up uh, a lot in, in conversation that we hadn't uh, chatted about tonight uh, was health care. And mm -hmm. so I just want to uh, recognize that our health care system is um, 
uh, broken in many ways, and particularly uh, folks' access to vision, dental, uh, hearing, and mental health. Uh, so that's also something that I'm really looking forward to um, advocating for and working on uh, as a state senator. Uh, as the mayor of Montpelier, I've got a lot of experience uh, helping to craft policy. And uh, while we've been able to make a lot of progress with uh, just the city of Montpelier, uh, if we're going to make a bigger change, um, I need a, a, a different seat. So I'm looking forward to working on all of these issues at the state level. And if folks are interested, my website is annwatsonforvtsenate.com. And I hope that I have one of your three votes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ann. And uh, we haven't even gotten halfway through the questions we have listed. <laughs> and we got lots of suggestions from people. We consolidated uh, suggestions and did the best we could. And there's still a lot of important issues, and thank you for raising that. So, Ann Cummings. OK, thank you. And thank you to Orca and to the bridge. Um, it is important that people get to see the candidates and see and hear different mm -hmm. views. Everything else we send out, we write. Um, it might be a little biased. Uh, this lets you see us in person and actually see our faces and hear our voices, and that's important. Um, I think you've heard tonight that there are really challenging issues. We didn't get to half of them. Um, they are challenging, and they do require that we work and we work together. I have over 20 years of knowledge and experience. I would like to bring that back to help us work on these problems um, and help us find the solutions that work for everyone. A lot of them is how do we pay for the things we know we need and would like. And as chair of the tax committee, I get to deal with that a lot. <laughs> thank you, Ann. So thank you again to all of our candidates, Paul, Lean, Paul Bean, <laughs> and Dexter LaFaver, Ann Watson, Ann Cummings, and Andrew Perchlick. And thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, by now, you should have received your mail-in ballot, or your ballot in the mail, actually. You don't have to mail it back. You can deliver it. Um, if you haven't, you should contact your city or town clerk to find out why. Uh, the best thing you can do to protect democracy is to vote, and we encourage you to do so. Good night.